uh, busy last week or so in, in, uh, in Australia. About five years ago, uh, Richard and I were, were asked to, to speak together at Stanford University, and Richard insisted that there be no moderator, because as he pointed out, the moderator always stops the conversation when it gets interesting. <laughs> and so uh, we tried that, and it worked, and we, and we had the pleasure of having several conversations on different subjects around the world, most recently a few times here in Australia. And as was pointed out tonight, we're going to have a conversation which is going to center on Richard's wonderful new book, Magic of Reality. And, uh, but it will probably go other places, because we're never certain of where, where it will go, and I'm sure your questions will be broader. And uh, so we'll begin, and um, I think it's appropriate to begin, actually, with, with a specific chapter, Richard, motivated by, did any of you see Q&A? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was at the same time debating a Muslim group in Canberra that night, and I managed to make it back in time to see the, the program. And uh, I was amazed, uh, Cardinal Pell, who was in the program, manifestly didn't understand evolution. Uh, actually, he manifestly didn't understand anything as far as I was <laughs> But that would require thinking, which it wasn't obvious. In any case, um, one, of the, one of the really wonderful chapters at the beginning of the book is... Uh, is a subject that, that really is, is probably one of the hardest things to understand about evolution. And the chapter is, who is the first person, really? And I thought we might start with that, because uh, maybe Carlo Hell will, uh, uh, is in the audience. <laughs> and, um, and, and so, I wanted to elaborate a little bit about that, that real problem, because I think it's a fascinating issue of, of if speciation occurs, if species change, uh, was there a first person? At first sight, it seems obvious that there has to have been a first person, and there has to have been a first rabbit and a first rhinoceros and things. After all, people are people, aren't they? And their ancestors were not people. If you go back sufficiently far, your ancestor was a fish. So that at some point between that ancestor, say, um, your 200 million greats grandparents, who were both fish, <laughs> and your actual grandparents, who were both human, there must have been a time, mustn't there, when the first human was born. Whatever the previous species was, and we tend to think it was Homo ergaster, or sometimes called Homo erectus, mustn't there have been a time when, so to speak, the last Homo erectus parents gave birth to the first Homo sapiens baby? And the answer is no. There never was a first person, there never was a first rabbit or first rhinoceros because every organism ever born belonged to the same species as its parents. Yet in spite of that, your 200 million greats grandparents were fish. It's not actually that paradoxical. It all happened very, very gradually. And you could think of parallels like the fact that you can't see the hour hand on your watch moving but yet if you come back an hour later, you find that it has moved. Uh, at some point, we cease to think of ourselves as middle-aged, and we start to think of ourselves as old. <laughs> but nobody ever goes to bed middle-aged and wakes up and says... <laughs> I don't know, Richard, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, it, so you, in order to understand evolution, you have to get the idea that it's extremely gradual, and there never was any animal ever born who belonged to a different species than its parents. And yet, because it was so gradual and because it was so slow, uh, not only was our 200 million greats grandparent a fish, but if you go back further still, they were worms and, and, uh, and so on. So um, people do have a problem with that. And uh, I think it may have been partly that, the idea that there's a kind of essential rabbit, an essential human, an essential kangaroo, um, and that gave rise to the difficulty that people had in understanding evolution in the first place. It's a bit of a puzzle why we had to wait until the 19th century for a Darwin to come along. And one suggestion that's been made is that people really have difficulty grasping the idea that animals turn into other animals so imperceptibly that you can hardly, hardly notice it. Ernst Meyer, who was a great 
American uh, evolutionary biologist, blamed Plato and Aristotle for essentialism, the idea which born really of the fact that, like so many of the ancient Greeks, they loved geometry. And so they had a sort of ideal triangle, an ideal parallelogram, an ideal straight line. Um, and they thought that that idea of a sort of geometric ideal applied to uh, kangaroos and, and rabbits and, and humans. Well, it just doesn't. Well, you know, actually, I want to, it's interesting because that touches on a point, uh, two points, one which we were talking about playing today about, but, but it, it also touches on the point that, I, as you know, I've had some problems with philosophers lately, and, and uh, don't be all. <laughs> But it's really, I think that science often changes the playing field, that, that, that um, Plato and Aristotle indeed created this idea that there was an essential chair, or there was something, some chairness that's fundamental and, and an essence that exists. And of course, science has demonstrated that that's just not the case. And, and we were talking about that even not just in the context of species, but also in the talk, context of humans, in the context of... A, of, of, of when something becomes a human, or when something becomes uh, anything else, like that, or a computer, when you're putting it together. I mean, it's true that there's been evolution, because you go from PCs to my Mac, but, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but what point when you're building it does it, does it become a it, I mean, It's not just that science says it has disproved it. it. It's incoherent. It doesn't make any sense. Um, the idea of a tree having treeness and it loses its treeness when somebody, when a carpenter comes along and makes it into a desk. I mean, it just, it's not a helpful way to put things. It just, it's a, <laughs> why should it have treeness? Um, I mean, one of the most ridiculous examples of this is the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, when the idea is that, um, well, they, they say that a, that a wafer, when blessed by a priest, turns into a first century Jew. <laughs> now, the, the philosophical justification for that, the philosophical justification, it comes from Aristotle, who said that the real substance of the wafer becomes uh, the body of Jesus, but it's just the accidentals that stay the same. Aristotle had made this, this distinction between the real substance, the essence, which is, which is not what you can see and touch. No Catholic actually thinks that, that, the, that the wafer becomes flesh in the sense that you can see and touch it as flesh or do a DNA test or something. But he makes this distinction between the substance mm -hmm. which changes and the accidents which don't. And this is obvious sophistry. It's, it, it doesn't need science to, to disprove it. It's just plain intellectual dishonesty. Well, it's, but at the same time, it's kind of, I, I don't know if you feel this, it's kind of frustrating how much of that, many of those fundamental misconceptions established early on, maintain themselves. I mean, Aristotle also talked about falling bodies so from a physics perspective. And, and uh, I, I remember once speaking to the leaders of the free world, actually, and I, you know, I had a book and a piece of paper, and I dropped them. And I said, which fall will fall faster? And book, and then I asked why, and of course, they all said because the book was heavier. And uh, it's kind of sad that, in fact, 400 years after Galileo, that, that, that He's only happened. just been forgiven, remember? Yeah, exactly. Maybe, that's, maybe we need more time for <coughs> Galileo. So it, 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 it is misconceptions maintain themselves, and it's, it's, it seems much easier to establish a misconception than to explain the reality. But as you point out, if you just think about some of these things in the context of your own experience, and I think people are... One of the problems, maybe, is the way we teach science. I, I, I don't know about this. That we, we don't teach it as a process. We teach it as a set of facts too often. And if, if, if we taught people that everyone is a scientist, that, that, that on the base, if, if there's a, the, a mantra that I really like, which is from the old publisher of the New York Times, who used to say, I like to keep an open mind, but not so open that my brains fall out. And, <laughs> and, but I think that's important. Each of you is responsible for deciding what's nonsense and, and not, and each of you most of you have the capability to do it because of your experience. And so if you look at something like that, you don't accept anything on authority. Because in, certainly in science, there are no authorities. They're just, they're experts from authorities. But people seem to want to be afraid to say, look, that just disagrees with my own experience. But in fact, if it disagrees with your own experience, it's probably wrong. And I think we need to do a better job explaining that. Yes, it, but, but we also have to beware of using our common sense too readily because so much of 
modern science, especially modern physics, is your subject, um, you actually have to throw common sense out of the window, otherwise you, you, um, <coughs> you can't get anywhere. Absolutely. That's, uh, in fact, another, another misconception that, that, that if it violates common sense, it can't be right. And, and uh, both of us have, I think, debated Christian apologists who, who've given arguments saying, it, you know, this is not logical, and, and um, logic depends on knowledge, and, and it changes. Um, the, the example I think we talked about the other day was, uh, was uh, I've often been presented with this syllogism that, that uh, all men are mortal, Tom is a man, therefore Tom is mortal. But of course, what happens in, by the end of the century when we may make cell lines immortal, or humans immortal, does that mean humans aren't humans anymore? The context of that changes depending upon the nature of reality, and the nature of reality, as you talk about the magic of reality, is in some sense determined by science. Well, let's talk about, if we talk about humans and life, there's another chapter, I want to jump actually ahead to one of the more fascinating questions, which is, are we alone, um, that you deal with. This, this question that everyone's asked at some point or another, are we alone in the universe? And, and Carl Sagan used to say, if, you know, if we are, then it's an awful waste of space. And uh, <laughs> uh, well, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yes, um, it, it is a fascinating question, and um, no biologist could really ignore the question of whether life as we know it on this planet is the way that it is because it had to be so, because there's no other way for life to be, or could there be radically different kinds of life? Could we imagine um, voyaging to different worlds, different star distant stars, and finding life on other planets which was radically different? Could we calculate the odds, the probability that there might be life on other worlds? And people have tried to do this for a long time, and nobody knows the answer, of course. Um, but what we can do is write down some of the things we would need to know in order to make a rough estimate. There's a thing called the Drake Equation, where Drake wrote down a whole lot of things like the number of stars, the number of planets, the probability of life arising on a planet, and so on. And you multiply the whole thing up, and it gives you a kind of measure of your, of your, of your ignorance, in a, in a way. But at least it tells, you, it tells you the kind of things you need to know. Well, when Drake first wrote, it was not known that there were other planets, um, that, that other stars than our sun had planets. One could make generalizations from the fact that Saturn and Jupiter um, have little kind of miniature solar systems of their own. And so it seemed quite likely. But now, astronomers are actually able to detect the presence of other planets going round uh, distant, not that distant, but, but other stars anyway. And they're starting to form a consensus that probably the majority of stars have planets. So that means that the first term in the Drake equation is now becoming known. And it looks as though the number of planets um, that might be available for life to evolve is more than 10 to the 20. It's a very, very, very large number, which means that in order to believe that we are alone, You've got to believe that something extremely unique happened on this planet. You've got to believe that the probability of life arising on a planet, on a randomly chosen planet, is stupefyingly low. And if you want to believe we are alone in the universe, that means that because the probability of life arising on any planet is so low, we're pretty much wasting our time even talking about how it might have arisen on this planet. We know that if it did arise once, we, we need to know it did arise once, and the place it arose was here. So if we are unique, then any chemist who tries to do experiments in the lab, trying to sort of replicate the process by which life arose, is wasting his time. Because the, the theory we're looking for has to be not a plausible theory, but a, but a highly, highly implausible theory, so implausible that it verges on impossible. Well, I don't believe that for a moment, but I just throw that out as a challenge to anybody who wants to believe that we are alone in the universe. Um, since I don't think it was all that improbable, I don't think chemists are wasting their time working on the problem, that means that I'm committed to the view that, there, that there's lots of life in the universe. But still, even if there's lots of life, even if, say, a billion separate origins of life have taken place. There are a billion separate life forms dotted around the universe. That's still incredibly rare.
because a billion is only 10 to the 9, we're talking about 10 to the 22. That's still incredibly rare, so rare that any one of those planets harboring life will be so far from any other that they'll probably never know about it, which is rather a, a, a sad thought. But it could be much, much more common than that. And then we can start asking the question, um, can we s speculate in an informed sort of way about the kinds of things we might expect to see if there were other life forms? As I began by saying, how much of what we know about life on this planet is unique? How much of what, of, of what we know about life on this planet um, just uh, had to be so because that's the only way for life to be and how much of it it just happens to be so. For example, would you expect to find eyes in, in, in alien life forms? Well, we can tell by looking at the family tree of life, the evolutionary tree of life on this planet, that eyes have arisen several dozen times independently on this planet, which kind of argues that eyes are rather likely to evolve, assuming that there's light, and there's pretty much got to be light on any planet that has life, because any planet that has life has pretty much got to be close to a star. Um, so you, you might infer that there probably will be eyes. There are, if you look at the eyes on this planet, there are about nine different optical principles, all of which have been used, and physicists don't know of any other way in which you could design an eye. I mean, there's even, a, even some scallops have parabolic reflector eyes, like a, like a um, reflecting telescope. Um, and then there are various other kinds of eyes. So I think it's not a bad bet that alien life forms will probably have eyes. And one can go through a list of other things and make similar inferences. Well, I want to I add to some things. And, and, and I think that, as you pointed out, the evidence is, is growing in many ways that uh, I, I would argue that, in fact, life, that we're not unique in the universe. Uh, certainly, we're, we're, we're clearly, I expect, not unique in our solar system because we've discovered that, that no planet is an island, that, that the material being transferred between Mars and the Earth and other planets, and that, and that uh, extremophiles, as they're called, can, could easily survive the void in a rock between Mars and the so Earth. So you mean that you would think there might actually be earthly life on Mars? Well, in fact, I think that the, uh, a friend of mine who studies this would said that the big surprise, if we discovered either extant life or not on Mars, would be if it weren't our cousins. Oh, yes, if we, if we find life, but, uh, but find I'd be surprised if we do find it. But, yeah, uh, I think we might, yeah. yeah. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if we found some evidence of past life, but yeah. the, the Martian environment was more, more conducive early on, but we'll find out. But, but, what, but what is interesting is we've discovered, as you pointed out, when we try and think about life, we try and extrapolate from what we know, because uh, there's a famous story that if you're the drunk comes out of the bar and, and loses his keys, where would he look? He'll look under the lamppost. Why? Because that's where he's going to find it. And, uh, and, and it's, it's simple. If you're a scientist, you know, the first hypothesis is to say, well, what are the conditions that led to life on Earth? And we, we, we're learning about those. We know organic materials, water, sunlight. And all of those things we're learning are much more prevalent than we thought. Water, we knew was prevalent. But we're discovering the basics of rather complex amino acids on comets. And, and we're discovering so that the basis of, of, of of complex organic, what would become organic materials, already exist in interstellar space, and so that already gives you confidence. But we're also discovering that things are strange, as we always do when we open a new window on the universe, that things are stranger than we imagine. As you point out, when we talk about Saturn or Jupiter, well, they have small planets, but we used to think that all solar systems that had Saturns or Jupiters, that they'd be way out far away and the rocky planets would be inside, and we've discovered that thinking was wrong, that solar systems are, can be much more exotic than we thought. And, and that means that the set of possibilities might be much larger. For example, you know, you just said that plant life needs sunlight to, 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 to uh, evolve in some sense, but maybe it doesn't. I mean, there can well, be- There's gotta be some source of energy and-, and or Maybe yeah. internal energy in the- It might be internal, exactly. yeah, And might, so yeah. we, we just don't know the, yeah. the set of, of uh, possibilities. And, That's right. And, and, you know, the Drake equation is a nice way of parameterizing, as you point our ignorance, but, but it's interesting. Actually, I never said this in a public forum, but I have a problem with the Drake equation in the sense that in physics, at least, we, we don't use absolute probabilities. Um, for in a particle physics experiment where there are millions of things happening, 
The thing we're looking for may have a probability of one in a million. But it could be that every other possibility has a probability of one in a billion. Yeah. And then even though this rare thing is rare, in an absolute sense, it'll be a thousand times more probable than anything else. So the question to me is, is, that might be interesting is not only just how rare is life, but is there, if you look at all the different pathways, how many pathways don't lead to life? Yeah. And it may be that, that even if it's rare, it's much less rare than the possibility that there's no life. So yes, I'm indeed. optimistic. It, yes. uh, of course, as you point out, uh, it's, it's life and intelligent life. Are too well, intelligent life, that's another whole barrier. If we think yeah. of, of a set of barriers to, to intelligent life evolving, the, the first barrier is to get life at all. And that, it looks as though that barrier is more or less synonymous with getting the first gene, getting the first um, self-replicating coded information. And I think that probably has to be digital, as DNA is digital. I'm not confident of that, but it probably does. It probably does not have to be DNA. It could be some other... Um, digital molecule. But then intelligence is another barrier way, way down the line. And um, there may be lots and lots of planets that have something like bacterial life, and only a tiny minority of them um, get to the point of having intelligent life. It's certainly not, not <coughs> obvious that intelligence is an evolutionary imperative. It's certainly clear that the road on Earth was a series of accidents, including the extinction of the dinosaurs, etc. Although whether the dinosaurs would become intelligent if they'd hang around, I, I don't know. But uh, they hung around for quite a long time. The, the, yes. <laughs> There's that. Yeah, I love that. I love that famous cartoon with the dinosaurs smoking cigarettes and it says, "Why the dinosaurs went extinct?" Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it is a. It, well, the interesting question is: is we don't. The interesting point is we don't know, and it would be. It's a long shot. It, it's a. Even if it's a point of, even if there are a billion life forms. Even in our galaxy, which is 100 billion, so may have 100 billion solar systems. There's questions: How long? I mean, on Earth, you could have been watching the Earth for the last four and a half billion years if you were on another star, and only during the last 50 years would you've known about intelligent life. Because of which is probably the only way you'd know about life at all, because that's the only way that information about life could have seeped out. Yeah, although <coughs> it, as, uh, I, we, were, we were just uh, talking to a young astronomer the other day when we were up at Mount Stromlo that. Uh, when we will, in, I think, in the lifetime of many people in this room, have at least a sense of the possibility of life on different stars because we can detect planets around those stars by looking at the planets going in front of the stars. Amazingly, it dims the star by, by less than 1%, a tenth of a percent of the light, but you can see it. But some of that light gets absorbed in the atmosphere, and one of the things you look for is, is, is oxygen. Because in the Earth, there was no free oxygen in the early history of the Earth. And so if you saw free oxygen in that planet, all the free oxygen on Earth was created by life. So it wouldn't tell you there was intelligent life, but it might tell you if there was microbial life. And so there are ways that we might, in our lifetime, get some empirical evidence for them. It would be very exciting if we detected a lot of free oxygen on a planet, certainly, yeah. So I think there's hope that we'll have a lot more empirical evidence one way or another in our lifetime, at least of the possibility of life in general. Um, I'm actually very pessimistic about personally about the possibility of ever detecting other intelligence because it's also not clear how long intelligence survives. Well, if, if you look around the planet now, um, <laughs> well, yeah. maybe we should go to a different topic. Um, <coughs> the, there's, a, there's a, of course, a, the, the next topic I wanted, I wanted to touch on was, was a great chapter is when and how did everything begin? And of course, that's one that's near and dear to both our hearts in the sense that, that both of us, in, in ways, have thought about origins one way or another. And, and one of the reasons we, we spent so much time together is exactly that reason. So maybe you want to talk about that. I suppose a, a major aspect of that problem is how did complicated and massive and um, impressively large things come about? It's relatively easy to understand how simple things could come about. It's not infinitely easy, but it's better, much easier to understand how simple things came about than how complicated things came about. And the whole Darwinian enterprise has been the explanation for how you can get these prodigiously complicated things like oak trees and wombats and, and, and humans, uh, starting from not nothing, but starting from something relatively simple like uh, naked genes in the origin of life. 
once you've got naked genes, once you've got something, some accurate self-replicating coding, um, then the Darwinian process kicks in, and we understand pretty much how you would get the diversity of life, how you would get the complexity of life, and the powerful illusion of design that living things convey. And that's the Darwinian um, solution, and, and we've known about it and understood it ever since 1859, with certain boosts in our understanding since. There was a big boost in our understanding around about 1930, when R.A. Fisher, who ended his days in Australia, by the way, um, and J.B.S. Haldane and Sewell Wright uh, pioneered the application of Mendelian genetics to evolutionary theory. That was a big step forward. And then the Watson and Crick revolution in 1953, when it was understood that genes are powerfully digital in their very nature. And that um, was another very, very major step forward. So we've now got a pretty good understanding of how you can go from primeval simplicity, chemical simplicity. It's not that simple, but it's relatively simple compared to life. How you can go from that to, first of all, bacterial life, and then increasing complexity of life, life with in ever enlarging nervous systems, and finally brains so powerful, human brains, that they can understand um, how the whole process, how the whole process happened. Um, that gets us back to primeval chemistry, and then biologists, as it were, hand over to physical scientists, and how you get um, chemistry, well, chemistry seems to be cooked. The, the, the chemical elements are cooked in the interior of stars, um, and then how do you get stars? Um, that's where I kind of hand over to Lawrence, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's um, I, I want to, before we get to that a little bit, I wanted to follow up. Uh, by the way, there's one <clears> thing I meant to say, which I, which I think is important. What, the interesting thing is these questions are questions kids ask. But when you re one of the things I was happy to say when, about, about this book in, 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 when I've written about it is that it's, it's, a, it's a book for everyone. These are, kids ask them, but adults ask them. And, and I think it's, it's, it's what's really nice about it is that it's a really a, appropriate book for young people, but also for adults, because uh, you shouldn't be embarrassed about reading this book, because it really talks about the very questions that we all ask, and, uh, and we should never stop asking. Uh, one of the, the interesting, I want to, if you comment about that, we, we had a meeting at my institute, which you were at, where, where we were trying to get at the origin of life. And it's fascinating to learn that, uh, how much closer we're getting. And one of the things that surprised me um, by bringing together geologists and chemists as well as biologists when you begin to make that handoff is that um, in the early Earth, it was quite different. And right now, it takes energy to build up complex molecules. And you wonder, how could the RNA form, which is probably the, before DNA was probably an RNA world, and, uh, which is what most of us think, uh, but how could you form such a complex molecule? And what's fascinating is in extreme conditions, the, that people study now in, in hot springs and other places, actually the chemistry naturally, it's, it, it doesn't require energy, it actually releases energy to build up complex organisms, so complex molecules. And so we, we are beginning, I think, to be getting much closer. I don't know if you think we'll get, we'll get to the beginning in your lifetime or my lifetime. Well, it's an exciting thought, and, uh, and I'm pretty hopeful that, that we might. You'll never be able to prove it for certain, I suspect, but, but to come up with a plausible theory that, that, that people say, oh, of course, that's so elegant and so simple. Um, either it's true or, or it blooming well ought to be true. I mean, that, it, it could... Um... I think you've hit the key point. It's plausibility. Uh, you know, I sort of jumped to, to my own field a little bit. I, I was kind of amazed. When we, um, so I wrote a book about how the whole... I mean, we talk about complex things like life arising from simple or non-life. It, it is amazing and fascinating to me, and we're celebrating that the laws of physics as we now understand them, including recent discoveries that have taken place in the last 40 years, some of which have been made here, in fact, have given us a plausible story to answer a question that's, that's amazing, which is how can something arise from nothing? How can a complex universe arise from a universe in which there was nothing, no particles, or maybe not even any space? And the fact that we now have that plausible route um, and you were kind enough in some ways to compare that argument to, in your afterword of my book to, to, the, to, to Darwin, but I think it's very clear what Darwin did before, what people don't realize is before Darwin, 
Everything was a miracle. Life was, every, everything looked like it was designed, and this illusion of design is, permeates the universe. But once he gave this simple, elegant idea, it became plausible, even though he didn't know about DNA or the mechanisms, but it became so plausible as, and you could make, and predictive, that you could make, uh, that you could make progress. And, and it is amazing to be in cosmology now that we are beginning to get back to, and, and realize that even something as complex as a whole universe could plausibly be created. But that's all we ever claim. And yet, w whenever we claim that, we're, we're called strident. <laughs> yes. Do you notice that? Yes, I do. Um, I mean, it, it, it came up in the, in the Q&A debate uh, last, last week. Indeed, exactly a week ago, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I tried to uh, very briefly expound Lawrence's thesis that you could get something from literally nothing. And the audience just laughed. I mean, it was obviously to them absurd. How could you possibly get something from, 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 from nothing? It does violate common sense. But as I said earlier this evening, you can't go by common sense. If we could do things by common sense, we wouldn't need physicists. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Yeah, we're experts in not having common sense. Um, but it is true. I, I think it, the world, that's the beauty of science. One of the reasons I like to communicate it, I'm sure you do, is that it takes us out of our myopic picture of reality, that, that we, we think is normal and natural is not always that way. And, and I often say, and I say again here, that I hope that every student has that experience once in their life of having some idea that, that is central to their being that they hold central to everything they think is true about the world, prove to be wrong. Well, common sense, of course, comes from what was necessary for our brains to survive in the Pleistocene of Africa. They, so they had to survive. They had to know how to catch a buffalo and how to find a waterhole and how to climb a tree when being pursued by a lion or something, which, which means that you have to understand about the physics of sort of large, solid objects bumping into each other in the way that large solid objects do. There was no cause to understand the, the weird behavior of um, tiny particles, quanta, and no cause to understand the weird way in which things behave when they travel at nearly the speed of light. So our brains were never shaped by natural selection to understand either quantum mechanics, the theory of the very small, or uh, relativity, the theory of the, of the very fast. Um, and so no wonder our common sense can't, can't do it. And it's actually a, an astonishing compliment to the human brain that at least some humans are capable of understanding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is really remarkable that we've been able to get as far as we can because no one can intuitively understand quantum mechanics. I mean, I wrote a book about Richard Feynman and he, he used to talk about quantum computing and he said, I hope we can build quantum computers because maybe then I'll understand quantum mechanics. And he developed it. But, uh, but, but, there's, but you hit on the, another point. Our brains didn't, not only didn't evolve to understand those aspects of the universe that it couldn't experience directly, but another aspect of the universe that it can't experience directly is long time. Absolutely. And I think that's yes. another reason yeah. why evolution is yes. such a hard concept, because we, we just see we have a slice of 100 years. We can, do, we can do seconds, minutes, hours, days, years, centuries, even millennia we have trouble with. I mean, when, when we think back to the Babylonians, the Egyptians, you think of this mysterious mists of ancient history. It's only, it's only a second ago by, by geological standards. And you, ca you cannot grasp the immensity of time that is a hundred million years. Um, or um, just, just it, e even the time since um, Homo erectus developed fire about a, a million and a half years ago. Um, even that is beyond our intuitive comprehension. You know, it really hit home for me recently, my own intuitive sort of misunderstanding. It's really hard to think about long time, but we, uh, there was a film recently, we actually we screened it at my Origins Project by Werner Herzog called Cave of Forgotten Dreams, which is about a cave with beautiful, beautiful artistic renderings that's about 35,000 years old, some of it. And What's fascinating to me, and it really hit to me, okay, I can think back 35,000 years is a long time, but some of these drawings, you can carbon date them, they were touched up continuously over a period of 5,000 years. Now think about that. 5,000 years, from, if you go back from now, mm. it takes us back mm. you know, to before, you know, to the mm. ancient Egyptians. 50 centuries. 50 centuries, yeah. but they were continuously living in 
or habiting that cave and uh, touching up those same drawings for 5,000 years. So uh, w w that comparison for me uh, uh, really made it. And I often think that, and you've used these comparisons, that the only way we could try and explain these things to ourselves as well as others is to relate it to things we understand. Relating how ridiculous a 6,000 year old earth is by comparing, you know, as, you, as I think you've used and other people have used, measuring this, the, the, the distance across the United States and saying it's, it's what? Eight yards. Eight yards, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and so uh, it's really important, I think, that, we, that when we talk about science, we try and relate to things we can have some intuitive grasp for because these concepts of large numbers, small numbers, long time are just something we, we weren't built to understand intuitively. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's move on to um, a, another subject that's not intuitive, perhaps. Why do bad things happen? And, and it's one yeah. of the chapters of your book that yes, I found fascinating. I, in a way, that's a rather superfluous chapter, because it's just an aspect of why do things happen. Um, but um, people do have a kind of totally misguided sense of natural justice that somehow bad things ought, ought not to happen to good people. <laughs> and, 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 um, uh, and of course, there's no, the, the universe doesn't care whether you're bad or good. I mean, if bad things happen, they just plain happen, and it's tough. Um, and then there's a, there's a sort of widespread view, which is sometimes called Sod's Law or Murphy's Law. If a thing can go wrong, it will. If you drop a piece of toast and marmalade, it always lands marmalade side mm. down. <laughs> uh, and again, there's, there's, um, there's no reason to expect bad things to, to happen. So th this is a chapter in a way to try to explain a bit of probability theory and how, um, how it's nonsense to say something like, um, well, I quoted an example of a, a pair of cricket captains. It was the captain of India and the captain of Sri Lanka. And some cricket journalist was speculating that because the Indian captain had won the toss six times in a row, it was, it, was, it was the Sri Lankan captain's turn to win, to win the toss. A lot of people believe that. A lot of people believe that there's a kind of natural justice that, that says that um, they call it the law of averages. And, and, um, so that's partly what it's a little bit of instruction in elementary probability theory, in the theory of risk and so on. But then coming back to talk about evolution, there is a sense in which the world is kind of out to get you. Uh, it's not quite like the toast <laughs> falling marmalade side down. But if you think about the way natural selection works, every animal, every plant has its enemies that are out to get it. So um, antelopes have lions that are out to get them. And lions have antelopes that are out to get them too, because if the antelopes were too good at getting away from lions, the lions would starve. And so, and of course, parasites are out to get everybody. And <laughs> so, in a way, if there's any animal species in the world which has life nice and easy, never has any distress, never has any pain, uh, never has any difficulty of, of anything, then something's gone wrong because what it means is, is, that, there aren't, is that the enemies are not doing their job. Um, if there was an animal that was never eaten by predators... Like then, cane toads, for example. Is that right? Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, it, locally, that may be true, but given enough time, new predators will evolve um, to, 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 fill the, to fill the gap. So there is a sort of sense in which the, the world is not only filled with misery, but is condemned to be filled with misery by a kind of Darwinian law. I, 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 da I, I, Darwin I, himself I, noted this. I mean, Darwin himself um, was actually quite distressed by the sheer amount of misery that, that natural selection prescribed, and he tried to comfort himself and his readers by saying that often death is swift and not too much pain is felt. And <laughs> you know, I remember a quote, maybe you know, I think it was a famous biologist, someone said, you know, when asked, and we often get asked, what's, what's the meaning of things, but what, someone said, what's the perfect purpose of life? And the answer was, to be eaten. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't put it that way, um, but, 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 y but y yes. Okay. <laughs> But, you know, this, the, the, this chapter about bad things happening it hits on another important aspect of science that I wanted to... Uh, one of the reasons I brought up as a question is, uh, is this sense that we have, and I think it's responsible for a lot of uh, religious belief, probably, too, that, that when something happens to us, it's significant. Yes. The, the, the physicist Richard Feynman used to, you know, used to 
say that the, we're the, easy, the easiest person to fool is yourself. So he'd go around, he, he used to go around to people and say, you won't believe what happened to me today. You, you won't believe what happened. And people would say, what? And he'd say, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and, and, and you know, you have nonsensical dreams for thousands of nights, but one night you dream that a friend is going to break their leg and then they break their arm and somehow it, 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 it has significance. And uh, Carl Sagan used a, a, an example in, in, in his wonderful book, uh, uh, um, with the can oh, I forget the title of it now, Demon Haunted World, um, about the miracle of Lourdes. I don't know if his, he, he, where he got it from, but uh, you know, there's something like 120 million people who've gone to Lourdes, France to be cured, and the Catholic Church very carefully monitors these, these things and has found out with 20 cases of people who were, who's, who've been cured of disease that can't be explained elsewise. And um, as he points out, there's never any arms regenerated or anything. It's, it's cancer or something like that. But the interesting thing is, if you look at the general population, the spontaneous remission rate from cancer is much greater. So if you go to Lourdes, <laughs> you have much worse for chance. But, but the interesting thing is, if you go to Lourdes and your cancer goes into remission, there's no way that you or I are ever going to convince you that it wasn't a miracle. Yeah. And I think, that, in fact, that's a perfect, perhaps, segue to, the, to one of the last chapters yes. in the book, which is, which is miracles. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Yes, well, you, you um, um, mentioned these sort of uncanny things where you, where you dream about somebody you haven't thought about for 35 years, and then you wake up and find that he died in the night or, or something of that sort. And various people have done calculations um, working out the number of people that, the, that there are dreaming all around the world. Um, and the number of people there are dying. And, um, and of course, um, you don't report the times that you dream about somebody, and you say, well, I dreamed about him, and I woke up in the morning, and do you know he, he didn't die, he hadn't <laughs> died. Um, so it's really the, sa the, same, the same point again. Um, you've just been quoting Richard Feynman. Um, there's, Richard Feynman had a, a, a story about when his wife tragically died of cancer. And really spookily, the clock in the room stopped at the very instant when she died. But Feynman was no fool, as you know, and he worked out the true reason, which was that the clock had a faulty mechanism, and if you picked it up and tilted it, it stopped. When Mrs. Feynman died, the nurse needed to record the time of death, and so she picked up the clock and it was a, the sick room was rather dark, so she took it over to the window and tilted it to see the face, and of course the clock stopped. Um, but even if that hadn't happened, even if there was not an explanation that it was a faulty clock, if it really had been a coincidental winding down of the spring of the clock at the moment when she died, that still would be not at all remarkable given the number of clocks that stop every day. I mean, this is um, exploited by a well-known conjurer stroke charlatan, mm -hmm. whom I will not name because he's so litigious, yeah. <laughs> who used to go on television and challenge people to go and, t and find a watch in the, in the house, which had either, which had stopped, I think it was, and then, and then he would say, I will hypnotize your whatever it is, I will, I will cast a spell and make your, use the power of thought to make your watch start. Uh, and. Um, uh, phone in, and of course, in no time at all, the phone started ringing because he was talking to two million people. Yeah. <laughs> and it only took one to pick up a watch, um, and, and the watch happened to start, or that the, the heat of the person's hand melted some oil which had congealed inside the watch, or something of that sort. Um, so, anyway, the, these sorts of stories that, that, that people tell, kind of spooky ghost stories that they take to be, to be miraculous. It's this, this is the kind of, st of story that um, possibly gives rise to uh, alleged miracles like the miracle of Fatima uh, when the Virgin Mary is supposed to have appeared and make the sun move. Do you know about that, 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 that miracle? It happened in about 1915 or so, I think. 17, thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and um, um, there, were, there were three Portuguese children and one of them, the sort of ringleader claimed that, that the Virgin Mary had, had um, visited them up on a certain hill many times and she promised that she was going to come back and perform a miracle to demonstrate uh, on, on this particular day 
it's alleged that 70,000 people converged on this, this hill in, in, in Portugal. And the sun was supposed to have moved. The sun came crashing down towards the ground. And um, uh, then it suddenly stopped crashing down and went back and went on shining as before. And you have to ask yourself, what really happened at, on that day in, in Fatima? One thing you'll be quite sure, the sun did not come crashing down. I mean, <laughs> because the, the same sun shone not only on the little town of Fatima, but on the whole of that, of that hemisphere. Um, so it would have been seen elsewhere. Um, if it had come crashing down, that would either would have meant that it fried the earth or else the earth was spinning on its, <laughs> on its axis in a totally um, new way and, and that would have been noticed and would have probably destroyed everything. So that didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, it would have. If the Earth suddenly stopped or changed motion, everyone would be thrown Every, off. Everyone would be thrown off. Yeah. Um, so, so clearly that didn't, didn't happen. Um, was there, a, was there a, a mass hallucination? Did everybody simultaneously suffer the same hallucination? Doesn't seem very likely, but it's at least more probable than the sun really did move. You've got to... That, that, uh, that's the key point, you know. It, it, when, when people talk about miracles, they talk about aliens coming down. Yeah. They talk about neutrinos fat, traveling faster than light. They... The, uh, the, and I've talked to journalists who said no matter how mundane or ridiculous the actual explanation may be, it's much more probable than the, what's being claimed. Exactly. I mean, th this was David Hume's cri criterion for, for, a, uh, for a miracle. I mean, I think the most likely thing that happened is that, is that one or two people, I mean, the, the, the girl told people to stare at the sun, which is yeah. a damn silly thing to do, yeah. by the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and that possibly in, induced uh, uh, some, some hallucinations. But, it, but not many people would have had to have suffered a hallucination for wild rumors to have started spreading. Exactly. We, are, we are a species that loves spreading rumors. If we hear a story, we love embellishing it. it we'd li we like to make the story get a bit better. And so that's probably, uh, what, that's probably what happened. I think the very idea of a miracle is actually incoherent. I mean, if if you see something which appears to be miraculous, think back to what almost any of our modern devices, think if you, if you could show that to a, to a medieval peasant and show what it can do, uh, that would be a complete and utter miracle. A Boeing 747 suddenly landing in, in, in 16th century Europe. I mean, just, just think about that. Um, let me... Let me, let me uh... Let me see if a miracle happened tonight. Uh, it's a test. And, it's, and I think it's a good way to end our discussion before we go to the questions. When we were arriving earlier, we, there was a couple, the two women, oh, yeah. what a sign saying, we're atheists looking for a miracle. Are there any extra tickets? <laughs> um, <laughs> did, if you're in the audience, could you, uh, could you shout out? Hey, a miracle happened. Is that okay, true? Well, we're very happy you made it. Okay, there we go. Proof in Good. miracles. Good. Great. Um, okay. So. I think that's, that's probably a good po point for us to stop and, 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 and open the floor to questions now. And I'm here to field questions. Um, we have some microphones in the audience. Number one, two. <coughs> Scientific thinking is not impossibly difficult. The sort of thinking that Lawrence Krauss does is impossibly difficult. <laughs> but, um, but, but actually, um, when, you, when you just think about what science can offer you, when you think about just going out and looking at the southern hemisphere sky and just reflecting on what you're seeing, what you're, what you're seeing is billions of stars, 
which are all different distances, and that means that the light that you're watching left those stars at, at radically different times. Um, when you look at the Milky Way, which is especially good in the Southern Hemisphere, um, you're looking at the galaxy in which you stand. But that's one of billions of galaxies. Uh, and it's, that's not difficult to understand. That's just marvelous to understand. It's poetic to understand. It deserves to have symphonies and oratorios performed in this concert hall about it. Um, but it's not that difficult. When you uh, contemplate your own body and think of the number of cells of which you're made, and when you think of the complexity of each one of those cells, when you think that the, if you took all the nerve cells in your body and stretched them end to end, they would go round the world. I forget how many times, but it's at least 20. Uh, these are facts which are easy to look up and easy to understand and utterly mind-blowing and not difficult. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna, I have been known to answer questions for Richard. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, and as a non-Oxonian, I think I'm allowed to. Um, uh, I come from Arizona where there isn't any culture. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it, it, it is, in fact, we've talked about the poetry of reality, but for me, for many people, the value of science is technology. And of course, it has produced the world we live in. Every, we couldn't have this event tonight if it weren't for science. But actually, for me, uh, the greatest value of, uh, of, of science is its cultural value, that the most amazing ideas that humans have ever come up with are scientific ones. And, and, and we owe it to everyone to celebrate them and to share them more broadly. And to somehow, and, and also, to argue that science is too difficult to enjoy is, 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 is amazing because people, people say, well, you know, you don't have to be a, a musician to enjoy a Bach cantata, but none of us could have written it. You don't have to be a Picasso to draw, well, maybe you could draw some of his paintings, but, but um, <laughs> and you don't have to be James Joyce to write a novel, like, uh, to appreciate that kind of novel, but somehow when it comes to science, you can't appreciate science unless you're a scientist, not just garbage. Science is remarkable, and, 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 and we, it's part of our culture. And we owe it to everyone to celebrate that part of culture, like music, art, and literature. Just can we go to the microphone? You spoke tonight about the uh, evolution of the past. Um, this question is about evolution into the future. Um, what effect do you think modern medicine, modern medicine has had on evolution? Do you think that in some way it's, it is stopping evolution in humans to some extent? I think the answer to that question has pretty much got to be yes in a sense, because there's no doubt that uh, modern medicine is keeping in the gene pool genes which in a wild state would have been eliminated. Um, so that can be regarded as a bad thing. On balance, I am glad that we live in a world of doctors and hospitals, and I approve of doctors. Um, your, your daughter's a doctor. So my daughter's right. a doctor, that's right. Um, and so I think it's a price worth paying. I would not wish to ban doctors from um, curing people with, with genetic diseases or ban people with genetic diseases from having children. I, I think there are ways you can alleviate the problem, and one of the ways you can alleviate the problem of the passing on of bad genes is, I mean, at present we have genetic counseling, people who, are, who, who have a, a bad gene like Huntington's chorea, which is a horrible, horrible gene. It's a dominant gene, which means if you've got it, you're for it. And it means you're going to die horribly. Um, in, in, uh, it means you've got a 50% chance. If, if, you're, if, you're, if your father died of Huntington's chorea, that means you've got a 50% chance of dying of it sometime in, mid, in middle age. Well, um, a gene like that, or uh, hemophilia, which is not so lethal but is still very, very dangerous, um, modern techniques can solve the problem. You don't just have to discourage people like that from having children. Using in vitro fertilization, IVF, where what you do is you harvest eggs from the woman and then you fertilize them 
in a, in a glass dish, and then you put back one or two of them back into the womb. Well, um, before you do that, and that's the normal thing you do with I IVF, but before you do that, it's possible to take one cell of the embryo. This might be an eight-cell embryo, some 16-cell embryo, something like that. You take one cell, which doesn't harm it. It can still develop normally if you take out one of these cells. And you can look at the genes of that one single cell. And so you can decide which of the embryos to put back into the woman and make sure you do not put back one of the ones that has the Huntington's chorea gene or the, or the hemophilia gene. So techniques like that are going to, be, are going to become available uh, to alleviate the problem that you raise. It's, uh, by the way, it always gets me that they talk about doc modern medicine as being hurting evolution, but no one ever talks about, no, not doctors, but lawyers who are clearly hurting evolution. <laughs> Two. First of all, I love your converses. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm currently in high school and I do study chemistry and physics. And I have noticed a lot there has been a decrease in the amount of science culture within science teachers. As in, they don't encourage students to take up science because they feel that their marks won't be very good or it won't like, help them get into university. And I want to know how can teachers overcome that, and how can teachers get students into science, and how can they overcome that Marx problem, and why won't they, like, where has the culture gone in science teachers? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, I'm not as familiar in Australia with the situation. Uh, as bad as it is here, I'm sure it's worse in the United States. But, <laughs> but, but, um, but it is, it's a fascinating statistic. It's a depressing statistic, in the United States at least, now, when it comes to middle school, for example, approximately 90% of middle school science teachers have no training in science. And, and what that means is that they're uncomfortable with the science. And that, that means two things. First of all, I've experienced it when my own daughter was young. That lack of comfort gets transferred to the students. The teacher is uncomfortable in the material, and the students get the sense that the material is, should be uncomfortable. But more than that, it means that they teach to the curriculum, which is a set of facts. And, and, the, and the one thing I'm sure we both agree is that, is that if I, I don't care, I assume when kids get to university, they know nothing. It's a good approximation. And, <laughs> and, but I don't care. The facts are unimportant. We, we tend to teach physics students we, as if they're all going to be clones, as if they're all going to become physicists. And somehow knowing how something goes down an inclined plane is important. It isn't. It's boring. But what we want to teach is the process of how to solve problems. But if you're not comfortable with science, you can't teach that process. And you can't go outside the curriculum, which is even worse. Because all kids are born to be scientists. They're all, we all ask those questions. But most of people don't realize the questions that they have are scientific ones. The questions we just talked about in this book, the wonderful questions here, are questions that everyone's asked, but we, you, we don't talk about them in school. And I think one of the reasons is that the teachers aren't comfortable leaving the curriculum. So what we have to do is do a better job of training teachers. I think the biggest problem of, 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 of science education is, is, unfortunately, is teachers. But there's a good reason for that. We don't, at least in my country, we don't adequately pay science teachers enough. That's if, you, right. if you've got a training in science, you can get a much better job, much more money, doing something else than being a teacher. And so in my own university, we're actually trying to help that at least by having courses where we actually train science teachers by asking these fundamental questions and pointing out and getting people. Richard actually came to my university and we filmed a, a little sequence where we'll have a conversation for an online course for teachers. But that teacher training I think is an important and then valuing teachers by paying them more, first of all, <coughs> but also doing something that's not very popular, at least in, again in my country, is saying Maybe market economics has to work, and we have to maybe pay science teachers a little bit more, not because science is more valuable than English, because it certainly isn't, but it's the way to keep people from, you know, bring scientists back in because they have other options. It happens in universities, for better or worse. I get paid more than my humanities colleagues, and, um, and, I, and I'm, you know, they can decide if I'm worth more, but, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I think you have to think of ways like, like that because. If, the, if, they, 
if they feel they need to, to teach to facts, then, then all is lost. I don't, I don't know if you want to add anything. Physicists go into the city of London or Wall Street and become hedge fund managers. It's true that, it is absolutely true that we're, we should realize that we're teaching the scientific method because most of our students are not going to be scientists. They're going to go out in the world, but, the scienti but knowing how to estimate how, 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 some n numeracy, those, if politicians had some numeracy, it would... <laughs> it, it, uh, I, one of the things I often do when I teach non-scientists is ask, how long does it take to count to a million? And you can work it out very quickly. It turns out to be about eight days. How long would it ca ca take to count to a billion? About 32 years. Gives you a sense of number. So if, if politicians had to count out the money they spent, maybe they'd, they'd think more carefully about it. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Speak up. I saw you in Melbourne. Oh. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what, I mean, I'm an atheist and I open it. Can you, can you, you, you got to stand close. I'm close. an atheist and I open it and start it. <laughs> well, I think that um, the word spiritual has possibly been hijacked by religion in the following sense. There are an awful lot of, of scientists who call themselves religious. And Einstein, for example, yeah. made many religious statements. Einstein was always saying things like, did God have a choice in setting up the universe? But, but he does not play dice and that kind of thing. And so a lot of people think that Einstein was religious. A lot of people think that uh, lots of other scientists are religious. But if you actually challenge them and ask them what they believe, it turns out they don't believe, and Einstein was most definite about this, they don't believe in a personal God at all, but they have a sense of reverence and awe for the mysteries that we still don't understand about the universe, and they have the sense of emotional reaction, as I was describing earlier, to looking up at the Milky Way, for example. And some people will use the word spiritual for that. And I don't care what word they use. I mean, you could, your words are our servants, not our masters. So by all means, call yourself spiritual if you have that reaction, as I do. But don't let religious people hijack you, therefore, and count you as part of their number because you call yourself a spiritual person. Don't let them hijack you and say, oh, you obviously must believe in God, or even worse, believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. <laughs> because you are filled with an emotional upwelling of feeling when you, when you look up at the, at the Milky Way. Let's be clear about the words that we use, and don't let other people hijack them, hi hijack you, and assume that you've joined their party because you have a normal human reaction to, whether it's the stars or poetry or music or whatever it might be. I mean, all the scientists I know are spiritual in the sense that they have a poetic reaction to things like music and art and, and the wonders of the universe. But that's very, very different from believing in something supernatural. I, I... <laughs> I just want to add one brief comment to that, that I think part of the reason people say that is because we're attacked. Scientists are, often people say science removes spirituality from the universe. Science takes, makes a wonderful, miraculous universe and makes it blasé and, and boring. And I, think, and I think the reaction that people are doing and saying, but I'm spiritual, is to, real, is, is to point out that science doesn't take the wonder out of nature. In fact, it, in fact, it enhances it.
Well, thank you for your talk. It's great to see you dance. Thoughts of each other? Okay. Um, you mentioned briefly about uh, the brain evolution. Um, I'd just like to say we, we, we're kind of developing a good understanding of the brain based behavior and personality. People with neurodegenerative disorders or these specific parts of the frontal lobe can develop personality change or even, uh, even have different moral uh, personality pre and post injury. And I was just wondering about your thoughts on what uh, the potential advances in neuroscience could have combating religious claims on morality. <laughs> well, um, I mean, ne neuroscience does and will, will increasingly explain why we have the thoughts that we do, and uh, it will, for example, um, since brain lesions, as you, as you say, can completely change your, your personality and even your, your, your morals. I mean, the classic case of this is a is a worker in 19th century America called Phineas Gage, and he was, he was dynamiting. And a ruddy great um, steel pole shot straight through his, um, his the, the dynamite went off prematurely, and a, and a steel pole shot straight through his, his head. And um, it completely changed his personality, and he became a morose, uh, rather unpleasant person. And, and um, that's just one example, but there are numerous other examples. The difference between somebody who is a nice, genial person, a moral person, an immoral person, um, will, will be a difference in brain state, and people can change. And so we, we have to learn that the, the personality that we think we are, and we think we're kind of somehow riding around inside our, inside our brain, we are our brain, uh, and um, we are determined by our, by our brain. And so, I mean, I think that will be one of the, the next major facts that undermines religion in the same sort of way as um, Copernicus, Galileo, and Darwin have undermined religion in their respective centuries. I, yeah, I, um, I, would, I would say, though, if I had a, a big spike sticking on my head, I'd be morose. And, <laughs> but but, um, but uh, th th we actually had a meeting at the, at the Origins Project on the origins of morality, and we had a lot of neuroscientists there. It's online. You should look at it. But, but I think it's really, it, it is undoubtedly the frontier that will, this issue of morality and understanding, of, it, it's, it's, at the same time, it's very depressing to know that in some sense we are so determined uh, that the illusion of free will in some sense is an illusion and that, uh, and that people can ask, one of the th remarkable things is people can ask, uh, there was a study that was talked about our, in, in our, our program where you can ask people 20 questions that aren't political, but based on that you have a 97% chance of, of knowing how they're going to vote. Uh, random questions, but, and, and so those are fascinating if somewhat depressing results uh, as we learn about our morality, but but one of the things that when Richard talks about spirituality being hijacked, what really, uh, the fact that religion has hijacked morality to me is a much bigger problem. That's monstrous, absolutely yeah, monstrous. It, it, yeah. It's, yeah, because it, <laughs> and uh, I, I've, I, in Canberra the other day and on the radio, I, I point out, you know, people say, well, if science is true, then, you know, if this is true, then there's no purpose to the universe as you're talking about and came for nothing, then, then you know, how can we, determine how we're going to run our lives. And I say, well, if, if you didn't believe in God, would you go out and kill your neighbor? And what I've discovered is a lot of people say yes. <laughs> it's true. I was, I was once on a radio talk show in Texas, and, and a man said exact, exactly that. He said, he said I would go and kill, kill my, my neighbor. Um, Herb, Herb Silverman said, well, I'm going to keep a, my safe distance from you. I mean, <laughs> uh, if you, if you really, if that really is your, if you really is, if, if, if religion really is the basis for your morality, that's the only reason you're moral, you're not a nice person to know. Uh, actually, Steve Weinberg, you, you know this quote, but I love his quote, where he says, there are good people and bad people, when good people do good things, bad people do bad things, when good people do bad things, it's religion. Yeah. <laughs> Take one question from five and one question from six, just to try and be fair, because it starts with number five. 
My question is about the endpoint of evolution. I'm a member of an international group of system scientists researching the interconnection between technology and humanity who will create a, a, a global brain. Are we wasting our time? And is God simply evolution work in progress? Um. <laughs> I'm not quite sure that I, I, I think there's a kind of hidden message there, that a hidden agenda there that I'm not quite sure that I'm, that I, that I'm getting. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's arguable that, that human evolution is going to be taken over by uh, technology and it, it may be, some people have already argued that, that, that genetic evolution is coming to an end as far as we're concerned, not as far as other species are concerned, and may be taken over by um, technological change, which is cultural evolution, and maybe in some science fiction future, we may cease to be here. And maybe, you know, some, in some future, uh, future century, there'll be a, a hall full of robots with silicon brains speculating that way, way back in some dawn age, there may have been some sort of soft, squishy things <laughs> uh, which may have given rise to, to the, to the nice, gleaming, metallic creatures that we are today. Um, I'm not sure if that's quite what you, what you meant, but I, if I, I apologize if I misunderstood. Perhaps, Lawrence, you understood the question. No, I, I, that's why I asked you to answer it, because I didn't. <laughs> um, I actually, yeah, well, you, the, your point is well taken. I, I do think, I mean, end point of evolution, I think, is, a, is an oxymoron. It, it, there's evolution, and it continues, and it's an incredible conceit to somehow assume that we are the pinnacle of evolution. And I do happen to think, by the way, that there's very little doubt that machines will become conscious and biology will have to adopt that at some level to keep up once you can have the program, the, the software and the hardware at the same time. It's, a, it, it, it's an advantage. And so it's, it, it's always seen as a bad thing in science fiction. The Borg, I always have to mention Star Trek. The Borg, <laughs> the Borg all, all these people, are, whenever a robot or machine is, has intelligence, it always it's bad, but it's, it's not obvious to me at all it would be bad, and, uh, and, it, and I think it's the future, so get, get used to it. <laughs> so up here on my left, number six. Okay. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for coming. Um, I was hoping to get your thoughts, if you gentlemen are familiar with um, Professor Gregory Chagas, who proposed the field of study, um, that, that he's calling metabiology, and in this field, what he wants to try and do is prove evolution through randomly mutating software using mathematical models where the mutations are simple enough to prove rigorous theorems at the same level of precision that is common in theoretical physics. I think that's for you, Lawrence. Well, actually... <laughs> well, uh, let me begin by saying that, you know, uh, I think Richard was a pioneer in some sense in that area of, uh, early on in, in the sense of building uh, models that, that mimic evolution, computer models. And I think there's... Um, it's, it's a, it's, it, it's, I suspect, as a physicist who's looked at biology and, and, and physics and biology are now getting very much closer, that it's a noble goal, but it's premature, I suspect. Biological systems are very, very complex. And, and that's why I do physics, it's so much easier. And, and I think it's a noble goal, and we will one day get there, perhaps. But, um, but I suspect to argue that we were on the threshold of, of having mathematical... We already do have proofs of evolution. I don't, I don't see why you need other ones. We have empirical proofs of evolution. And being able to model systems that are extremely complex is a very difficult thing to do, especially when there's so many variables over which you don't have control. One of the reasons physics has been so successful as a discipline is that we can isolate extraneous variables. But it's much harder in biology, and so I think it's a long way off. I don't know if you want to add to that at all. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Very, it's, thank you very, very much. Thank you.